it's good to be back home. Some changes since I've been gone. It's now Bishop, and I'm excited. I told him this. I told him when I saw him tonight. I said I like his title better than mine. Global Senior Pastor. That I don't know where that came from, but I like Bishop. That's great. God bless you all. Good to have you here on a Wednesday night. And those of you that are watching by streaming, God's got a good word for you. You got to make me feel at home. Aloha. Aloha. Oh, now I feel at home. Listen, just before I get into the word, there's just a few books I have. I couldn't bring them all. This is my latest book. It just came out called The Multiplying Church. It's, it's the secret sauce for what we do. You say, why would you share it with everybody else? Because I want the church to grow in power. You say, well, I'm not a pastor, so I don't need to read that. You are the church. Well, that went over real big. I said, you are the church. Amen. Amen. So uh, it'll help you in every area of your life. Then there's some books on the demonic. One is called Defiled Overcoming Satan's Assault. One is coming, uh, called Closing the Forbidden Door, an expose of the demonic. It's how demons infestate people, how you get rid of them. And then you can be a winner in the invisible war, the power of binding and loosing. Are you ready for the word today? Stand to your feet. Come on, let's get into the word. I want you to turn in your Bibles to three passages of Scripture, very short passages, but they're profound passages. And um, <clears throat> we're going to look at it together, starting at 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 10 through 13. Then we'll jump over to 2 Samuel 2 and then... 2 Samuel 5. So let's read the word of the Lord. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel <clears throat> said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking, and the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord, everybody say, The Spirit of the Lord, the of the Lord. came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Now let's take a look at 2 Samuel 2, just for a moment. In 2 Samuel 2, we want to begin to read at verse 1. It happened after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. And David said, Where shall I go up? And he said, To Hebron. So David went up there, and his two wives also, Ahinoam of Jezreelite, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David brought up men who were with him, every man with his house also they dwelt, in the city of Hebron. Then the men of Judah came, and there they did what? Anointed David king over the house of Judah. Now let's take a look at 2 Samuel 5, just for a moment. And starting to read at verse 1. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed we, indeed we are your bone and your flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, You shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. Therefore all the elders of Israel came to that king, the king at Hebron. And King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they did what? Anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. You have a specific word for your people that have come tonight. A word that will break yokes, a word that will change and transform things, a word that is going to set into motion things you have desired to do for a long time, and you are bringing them to that moment. So I'm asking for a special flow of your power. Come on, people, pray in the Holy Ghost. Spirit of the living God, come upon me in power. Give me great liberty to preach your word. May there be an impartation that happens tonight. May your word come alive in the hearts and minds of your people. 
I pray, Holy Ghost, that you'll give us ears to hear, a heart to respond, and eyes to see. And when we leave tonight, we know we've heard from you and our lives are changed. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Every year I ask for a word for our church worldwide and a word that will be fulfilled when that word is preached wherever I go. I feel led to preach that word to you tonight. And if you're watching by streaming, this is your night. You're here in this auditorium. This is your night. The word that's about to be received by you. If you receive it and believe it, it will happen. I also ask for a text that reaffirms what I sense the Lord is saying. And then I ask for confirmation. Well, the text the Lord gave me were the three texts that I've read tonight. The first one, of course, 1 Samuel 16, you know about it. Saul has disobeyed God's command twice. And the second time he disobeys, Samuel said to King Saul, you have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. What a tragic statement. God instructs Samuel to go to Jesse of Bethlehem's house. For he said to him, God has chosen one of his sons to be king. Now the only problem with Samuel going there is, as you know, Saul was extremely jealous. So he couldn't go there to anoint a king publicly. He had to do it privately. And so he shared that there was going to be a feast. And he went to Jesse's house. Well, in the text, you notice that all the sons of Jesse paraded before him, but none of them were the one that was chosen. And then Samuel asked, do you have any other sons? And of course they said, yes, there's one more. There's David. He's a shepherd boy. What's amazing is he wasn't invited to the meal. He wasn't invited to the festival. Now, some people have interpreted that to mean that maybe he was an illegitimate child, I think that's a possibility, but I really think Josephus has the right answer. Josephus was a Jewish historian in the second part of the first century. And here's what he said. He said that David was 10 years old. At 10 years old, he wasn't a man yet, so he wouldn't be a part of a feast like this with the prophet Samuel. Now, given that, you also are aware that it says he was anointed before his brothers. But the brothers really didn't know what it was that was happening. And you know that because later on when David went to the front to give cheese and crackers to his brothers by the command of his father, he came face to face with the giant Goliath and he began to talk about uh, what would be given to the person who defeats Goliath. And Eliab, David's oldest brother, begins to ridicule David as simply being a shepherd and that he was arrogant and proud. Now, he wouldn't have done that if he was knew he was going to be the next king of Israel. But David knew something happened because it says the spirit of the Lord came upon him. Now, I want you to think about this just for a moment. That's the first incident. The second incident is that he's anointed not only under Samuel, but he's anointed in 2 Samuel 2. In this case, King Saul is dead, and David seeks direction from the Lord. And God directs him to go to his tribe Judah and specifically to the city of Hebron. Well, the result of David's prayer and obeying is that he's in the right place at the right time to be anointed king over his own tribe, Judah. Now, this is the second anointing. Then we come to the third anointing found in 2 Samuel 5. And in this case, what has happened, this is seven years after he was anointed king of Judah. All of Israel come to Hebron and they anoint David for the third time. Now he's king of all Israel. And David fits the criteria of kingship. Of course, he's an Israelite. And secondly, he's a great military leader. But the most important thing is that he was anointed by Samuel. And they knew that. In fact, they said that 
He would be ruler over Israel who would be shepherd of his people. It's the first time a king of Israel was called a shepherd. And it's fascinating to me that we read the, the, the Lord's, we read the shepherd, shepherd psalm in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Who's referring to God as being a shepherd and who Jesus said, I am the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. It started there with David. It was a prophetic word that the true Messiah would be a shepherd. Well, that brings us then to this question. Three anointings, what's that all about? And you notice there was a period of time that passed before the first anointing and the time David became king of all of Israel. If David was 10 when he was anointed the first time, it was 20 years before he became king of Judah And 27 years before he became king of all of Israel. Now let's stop for a moment. Because you got to think about this. Why? There were kings that were 10 years old. There were kings that came into their kingship young. Why was there such a period of time? So oftentimes we'll get a word and we'll go, hey, how come this isn't happening? How come it isn't happening right now? Could it be that David wasn't ready to carry the weight of what God had for him to do? Could it be that sometimes the fulfilling of the word of the Lord is waiting on something on us to be ready to receive? And I want you to think about this just for a moment because you'll notice that the Spirit of the Lord came on David and certain things began to happen and literally he began to be shaped by the Spirit of the Lord. It's amazing. First first thing you'll notice is that he began to sing songs and play an instrument. It prepared him for a moment when he would get into the king's court to play music so that Saul's demonization could pass for a moment. You'll notice, for example, that he was also known to be a good fighter and ended up becoming uh, Saul's armor bearer. Think about that. Now he's not only in the court, he's now close to Saul. He's learning what it means to be king. You'll notice, for example, that he goes back and forth to his father and one of the t- uh, tw- twice the spirit of the Lord came upon him. He killed a bear and he killed a lion. Now think about that for a moment. I went on a safari in Africa and, and you know, they have those open jeeps you're sitting in. And, you know, I'm, I'm, there's, a, there's a whole uh, pride of lions sitting there. And, and I happened to tell the guide, hey, uh, you know, we're really exposed here. He said, oh, don't worry about it. They won't attack. But then when the elephant came, he said, now you got to worry. And when the hippopotamus came, oh, boy, began to tell us stories of hippopotamuses charging. Now, I have churches in Alaska. They go bear hunting. They have the biggest, baddest gun they can find. Because if they shoot that thing and they don't hit it well and it doesn't drop, they're dead. The guy who's shooting is dead, not the bear. (laughs) And the lion, can you? Now think about it. He didn't have a gun. He didn't have a bazooka. He wasn't in a tank. He had his bare hands and he had a slingshot. And and what really gets me is that he's he he says these this bear and lion were trying to take a sheep. Now listen, if I was David, I'd say. You can have the sheep. I mean, hello. I'm not going to lay down my life for that. Something was different about David. It was the anointing. It was the anointing. And it was God's way of preparing him for a moment when he would stand before the giant Goliath. And in the defeat of Goliath, David came into the limelight. Oh, somebody ought to get excited. And he became a very successful military leader. 
But one of the most important things about David, he was faithful to King Saul even when King Saul was trying to kill him. Now I want you to stop and think about this a moment. He had an understanding of the anointing. You see, he understood that Saul was, the, was God's chosen king and to dishonor Saul was to dishonor God. We take very lightly the anointing at times. You be careful. You be careful what you say about your pastors. You be careful. God hears it. You say, well, what if they're doing wrong? Well, then you confront them. But you do it on a personal basis. And then if they don't repent, then you go with two or three. Then you bring it to church. You do it right. You don't go doing anything else. They're anointed. Now, here's the most amazing thing. What you sow is what you reap. Because David sowed seeds of faithfulness, what did God give him? Faithful and loyal men. So loyal were they that at one time as they were hiding from Saul, the Philistines had taken over Bethlehem, David's hometown. And he, he just simply in an expression said, oh, I'd like to drink water from the well in Bethlehem. And three of his men heard it. And they crashed through the Philistine lines, shed their own blood to just get him a cup of water. Whew. Now that's loyalty and faithfulness. David was so moved he couldn't drink the water. He poured it out as a sacrifice unto the Lord. You reap what you sow. Finally, David became dependent on God for every juncture in his life. Every time he sought the Lord. You say, well, pastor, that's all good. But what is God speaking to us today about? Well, I believe the word that God gave me for you tonight and for my church worldwide is this word. It's the word fulfilled. Everybody say fulfilled. Everybody say fulfilled. All of us are marked by moments of fulfillment. One of the great moments will be when we breathe our last breath and heaven becomes our home. It begins the moment we receive Christ, but we see the reality of it when we're ushered into the presence of the Lord. In life, there are moments of fulfillment, that graduation, that promotion, that getting married, the birth of a child. Um, I can go on and on and on, buying of that new house or that new car. There are moments of fulfillment. But there are moments when God's promises are fulfilled. When you read the Gospels, you'll read a phrase over and over again to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. There are prophetic words that God yearns to fulfill in your life. Some of those words come just in your reading of Scripture. My mama used to read a new Bible every year. She would take a Bible and she'd write in it. She would mark promises God gave her. She'd put dates by it. It was very powerful. She would put commentary on the side. And then she would finish up the year after reading it all the way through in one year, get a new Bible and do the same thing. Because she believed that the word of the Lord was ever present. It was always God speaking. She may have read the same verse, but God would use it in a unique way to her. And it would be an awesome gift to get one of Mama's Bibles. Sometimes God speaks through visions and dreams. There are times God has spoken to me in dreams, specific dreams that have brought me through very difficult things. I've shared at times about how our church, we built the largest church building in the state of Hawaii, and it was halfway built when we ran out of money. And, and when you're building a building that size and you run out of money, you're in trouble. And I had four lawsuits against us. Kid got hurt in football practice and on and on and on. And God gave me a word. 
The word was out of Isaiah. It shall come to pass in that day that the burden will be lifted from your shoulder and the yoke from off your neck and the yoke will be destroyed by the anointing oil. And I began to preach a series of, me of, of meetings entitled Breaking the Yoke. And every morning in the early morning prayer meetings, we would pray, break the yoke. And did you know God brought a, a bank alongside to refinance? And then he, he, he solved every one of those lawsuits. And two of them he solved in dreams in the night. One dream he said, when you get up in the morning, do this, this, and this. I did exactly what he said to do in that dream. The second one, he said, when you, he said, I want you to hire this particular lawyer. He gave me the name of a lawyer I'd never met. The next morning I got up, that was in the time when we had telephone directories. And I, I looked through a telephone directory, found his name, called him on the phone. We had a lawyer. The lawyer was not helping us. We'd been going for months and he seemingly didn't have a grasp. He was an insurance lawyer. And uh, it, just, it just wasn't working. It looked real bad. So I called this man on the phone, told him that I'd like to hire him. He said, you know, I'm not the person you hire to defend you. I'm the person you hire if you want to sue somebody. And then he stopped. And there was silence. And then he said, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'll take your case. He walked into that courtroom and in 30 minutes it was over. Something that had been going on for months was over in 30 minutes by a dream. There are times when God will speak to you in many different ways. He'll speak to you through a prophetic word. And then sometimes it'll come by just simply a desire. He'll put a desire in your heart. David had a desire to build the temple. Even though he couldn't do it, he, he, he took the steps of faith to provide the resources for it. There are many ways God speaks, but keep in mind that he has promises for you. And there are moments when those promises will be fulfilled. I believe 2021, we have moved into a moment of fulfillment of things that God has put in your hearts. And it's the starting of a 10-year period where there will be fulfillment after fulfillment after fulfillment. You say, Pastor, that's pretty bold. You know it's pretty bold. When the Lord gave me that word, I was very hesitant to share it. Because I said, God, I, I don't want to give false hope to people. You've got to confirm this. Prophet Critcher, are you aware of the fact that in September of last year, you were at the prophetic conference and you prophesied over a lady by the name of Maud Cumming? Maud, Maud is the head of my social service arm, Family Life Social Service. It's the largest social service arm on Maui dealing with the homeless. And you said something to her. You said, you have been doing a lot with a little. Now the Lord will give you a lot to do a lot. You didn't know it. But at the beginning of this year, huge sums of money have come in. I'm talking so huge that I'm afraid to even tell you. From unexpected sources... So much so that their budget will double this year because of the finances. The Lord reminded me of it. But the thing that got my attention, it was in the first Sunday, second Sunday of September. I was still weighing in my heart this word. At the end of the service, I walked near the back and there was a man who said, Pastor, can I talk to you? It was the end of the service. And so... He got up and I was about ready to talk to him and he saw a line line up behind me where people wanted to see me. So he said, Pastor, I wanted to share a testimony, but I think I'm going to need to do it when we have some time. I said, well, let's meet tomorrow. So he came into my office the next day. That was a Monday. And he told me a story. I was asking God for a confirmation of this word. And the story he told me shocked me. He said, you know, I was adopted at two days old. I don't know my birth mom, never met her, never met my birth father. I was adopted by a wonderful family. They, were, they gave me a great life. But about 25 years ago, I began to have a desire to know about my birth mom. So he asked his adoptive parents if it'd be all right if, if he could try to figure out a way to find them. They said, sure. 
25 years passed. Everything he did came to a dead end. There was nothing he could do to find his birth mom. On January 9th of this year, for the first time in his life, God supernaturally opened a door and he talked to his 92-year-old mother who lives in New York. He lives on Maui. He came to find out he had half-brothers and half-sisters. And between that time and now, one of the half-sisters came, and I got to meet her there on Maui. And he told me after he'd talked to his birth mom, he wept and he wept and he wept and he wept. It was as though God was healing something broken in him that had been broken. He's in his 70s. I said, God, I guess I'm going to have to preach this message. Fulfilled. 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 There's only one problem with this message. We have a part to play in fulfilling God's promise. You see, we must believe and obey his word. David inquired of the Lord and obeyed what the Lord told him. We must seek the Lord and do his will. You see, you can, you can abort God's promise. Saul did. Did you know God gave Saul the same promise he gave David? That he would have an eternal kingdom? Did you know that? He aborted it. You'll notice something about David that he understood and he worked toward fulfilling the purpose for which God had him become king. In Psalm 57, 2, he says, I cry out to the Lord Most High, to God who fulfills his purposes for me. In Psalm 138, 8, he says, The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love endures forever. He understood that anointing that happened on his life had a purpose. Everything that had happened to him to the point of that third anointing had a purpose. He said, well, what was that purpose? It was to fulfill something that wasn't fulfilled under Joshua. There was the borders of Israel that were supposed to be taken care of. The people were to inhabit, Israelites were to inhabit, but they didn't finish the job. And they were being influenced by the Canaanites who were still living in the land. It was David who expanded the borders of Israel through his victories in war. You'll notice the first thing that David did when he became king was that he moved the capital from Hebron to Jerusalem, a little bit more north. He was trying to unite the entire kingdom. Secondly, you'll notice that he defeated the Philistines twice. He defeated them then at, uh, at remember the story of the, uh, Baal Parazim in the valley of Rephaim where David, David attacked the Philistines head on and defeated him. And then they re-rallied and, and God said, now don't attack them that way. You wait under the balsam trees. And when you hear the rustling in the balsam trees, do this. He did exactly. and He defeated the Philistines. If you, if you didn't realize that he gave them a blow that was very hard for them to recover. You'll notice he understood all the promises God fulfills in our lives is for God's glory, not his own. He says it in Psalm 119, 38, fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be feared, that your glory would be seen in the world. And David yearned for the presence of God. He, 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 he brought the ark to where he was in Jerusalem. Think about it. Samuel didn't do that. Saul didn't do it. David did it. He understood that if there was going to be a fulfilling of the purposes of God, he had to get into the presence of God. I'm so thankful you're here today. I'm thankful you said, I'm going to the house of the Lord. I'm going to be in his presence tonight. I'm thankful for those of you that are watching by streaming. God wants to do good things, but we need to get into his presence. God wants us to take steps of faith beyond our ability. 
He's led me in that realm for a long time, especially in the realms of giving, beyond anything that I could do in the natural. At the beginning of this year, my wife and I felt led to set a goal to give $200,000 this year. That's a lot of money, and I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm not a businessman. And we've already given almost $3 million into our church over the time we've been a pastor. That's not a lot of money to you. It's an awful lot of money to me. But I'm going to tell you something about what I learned about God, that there is no possible way I can ever outgive him for with everything I've ever given him. He's poured back into my life way beyond. But he asks of me to take a step of faith. And, de- and you know, Paul the apostle understood that. And in 2 Thessalonians 1.11, he says, With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that God would count you worthy of his calling. And that by his power, listen to this, by his power, by his power, he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. Did you hear how Paul prayed? God knows the purposes. God knows the steps of faith you take. And he prayed that God would fulfill. Tonight, I've released a word over your life fulfilled and released a word over this church. I've been coming to this church for a long time, Bishop. You've been so kind to let me holler and scream at your people. (laughs) Of course, we all love you and Prophet Jim at our church as well. But I'm here to declare to you that if you believe what I've just told you, that this is the beginning of something that you've cried out for. There's going to be moments of fulfillment this year. It'll start for an entire 10 years. I've already seen it happen. We're one church in almost 500 campuses, but in May of this year, at our 41st anniversary, We declared that in the next four years, between now and 2025, four years, we'll be one church in 1,200 campuses ministering to 120,000 people, and it's already beginning. I'm buying buildings, building buildings. We have seven or eight building projects going on simultaneously. We're buying buildings everywhere. You say you're crazy. I am insane. I'm insanely in love with Jesus. I'm insanely in love with his kingdom and wanting to see it advance. And I will take those steps of faith he asked of me. But I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith. Tonight we're going to receive an offering. Now everybody listen to me. This is very crucial. I'm going to ask the ushers to come real quickly. And they're going to give you an envelope. The reason I'm giving you an envelope is not because you have to give necessarily in that envelope. You can text to give. Those of you that are on the... Um, uh, watching by streaming, you can text to give. But here's what's very important. Everything in God is based on faith, as you mentioned. And one of the great ways to express your faith is by your giving. Now, I'm your guest speaker, but I'm going to give $1,000 tonight. This does not come to me. It comes into this house. Now, I'm going to tell you why. You all are facing an intense desire on the part of your pastoral team, and especially your bishop, to begin to invade Washington, D.C. in a greater way. Isn't that true? Do you believe God can fulfill that? Do you believe God wants to use you to be a part of that? Not only will he fulfill that, but he'll fulfill the desires he's put in your heart. And that's why I want the envelope. I want you to take the envelope right now. Listen to me. I want you to write on it what you're believing God for. Let me have an envelope, please. Let me have an envelope, please. I'm giving. And I want you to make out your check. If you're writing a check or if you're giving cash or if you're putting it on the Internet, if you're going to put it on the Internet like that, I want you to take a sheet of paper and stick it on your refrigerator door of what you're believing God's going to fulfill. This is not a game and this is not a hype. This doesn't come to me. I'm giving in this offering. Everybody understanding this? I'll never receive an offering for myself. If I talk on giving or if I challenge people, it's going to be for the house. 
And those of you who know my ministry know that there's been times I've come and I've given just like you've given into this house. And we're going to do that tonight. There's some people here that are going to match what I'm giving, $1,000. There are some here that God already spoke to you, $5,000. And there's a few here that God has spoken to give ten. In fact, there's somebody here that God has been speaking to you about giving a very large gift and you've been holding off and holding off. This might be a good time in this moment where faith will be released in your life. Now, here's what we're going to do. I want you to write it out. I'm going to write out my, my gift. And I'm going to ask you, we're going to worship the Lord. The worship team's going to come. And we're going to worship the Lord. And what I want you to do is simply come up to the front and lay it here at the altar. Just lay it here. Lay the envelope here. And uh, if you're writing a check, just lay it here. If you're putting on a credit card, you can fill it out on there and lay it here. I'm going to lay mine here. If you're texting to give, you bring your phone up and you hit this, uh, this stage with your phone. If you want to lay that envelope there to believe God with you, I'm going to pray over these things. So I'm going to ask you to come real quickly as we worship. Let me make out my, my gift as well. So let's worship. And you come as an act of worship and just lay it right here. Would you come? Come on. Let's worship the Lord together.